You'll see why we put that up there in just a moment or two. Can I say, Croiso, welcome, and it's good to see each and every one of you. A word of explanation, I think, before we go any further. This morning, if you were here at uh, our morning service, uh, during the uh, notices, Darren said that this evening we were expecting a guest speaker from South Wales. He didn't turn up. He didn't turn up. So uh, I, perhaps you'll put up with me. Is that okay? Yeah, good. Welcome. It's good to see you. It really is. Uh, I'm delighted that you've been able to join us for this, uh, the second evening of songs and hymns of worship uh, that we've uh, had. Uh, if you were here for the last one, it was led by our pastor, and you know something of the format. Well, this evening will be the same format. Nothing complicated. We're here to sing. We're here to sing praises and worship to our God uh, and uh, acknowledging everything that he's done for us in the person of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Delighted to have Delwyn helping us out this evening and, of course, Maxine across there. And uh, delighted to have Elaine and Darren uh, on, the, uh, on the stage at the back. Well, why don't we get on with it? Let's just commit things to God in prayer, first of all. Our God and our Father, we thank you for this, the Lord's Day. We thank you for every experience that we've had already uh, of your uh, grace and mercy towards us, Lord, this day. Thank you for every member we've got, Lord, of this morning's service. We thank you, Lord, for the way that we were able to worship you freely. And thank you, Lord, for the way that we were able just to listen to our pastor preach that remarkable sermon, Lord, this morning. And, uh, Lord, we pray that you would be with us now this evening, that you would grant unto us the ability, Lord, just to praise you in a manner which is pleasing as far as you are concerned. Lord, clear our hearts and our minds of all those things that would hinder us concentrating upon you this evening. And we pray that our eyes might be firmly fixed upon he whom we know as Lord and Saviour, and, who's in, and in whose name we come into your presence this evening. Uh, we pray it in his name. Amen. Amen. Well, there we are. The first uh, hymn, can you put the uh, first verse up, Elaine? That would be useful. Uh, crown him with many crowns. It's one I guess that we know quite well. We've certainly sang it here on several occasions uh, over the more recent months. Let me just read it to you. Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon the throne, while heaven's eternal anthem drowns all music but its own, awake my soul and sing of him who died for thee, uh, your saviour and your matchless king through all eternity. Some of those words are different to what some of us know. Sing the words on the screen. Okay? That's the easiest thing to do. Good. Let's stand. Let's worship God together.
me for long, because we're just about to sing another song. That, uh, that hymn, if my memory serves me correctly, was written during the 18th century. Well, a little bit more up to date for the next one, uh, but nevertheless, it's uh, a great hymn, and uh, well, it guards the integrity of God's word, and it extols the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Shine, Jesus, shine. How many of us know it? I guess that most of us know it, uh, know that, uh, that Delvin knows it very well, so if we can put the first uh, verse up, that would be great. Would you like to stand? Are you up for that? Yeah. If at any time during this evening service you feel my legs are a bit weary, well, think of me, all right? <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, no, seriously, not for a minute. If your legs are getting a bit weary, don't be embarrassed about it. Sit down. Okay. Thanks, Maxine. <clears throat> Please be seated. It's great to have Caltra with us again this evening. Caltra has been with us for a couple of weeks now, and you've got a couple of weeks to go. 
and you've enriched our fellowship enormously already with, uh, uh, with uh, everything that you've brought to us. Now, Calter has already been up on the pulpit here on one occasion. Uh, that was last Sunday uh, when she was interviewed. Uh, but we thought it would be a good opportunity to take, well, to have Calter up here again uh, this evening. And our pastor has volunteered. Uh, well done, Gordon, uh, to um, interview her. What would you like? <coughs> Actually, I'm not going to interview her, I'm just going to wind her up and set her off and let her go. Um, you've only actually been with us one week. Hugh just thinks it feels like two weeks. And you've got more than almost a month still to go with us. But it's a joy to have Caltra with us. She's from Albania, but she's studying in Scotland. She speaks with a kind of American English accent. So I'm still struggling with English. I think it's pretty impressive. So, Caltra, I know that you just want to share something of your stories. Most of the people here um, would have heard something of it, but there's, there's some people here tonight who wouldn't have heard of you or met you before, so it's great to have you. Why don't you just share something that we want God to, what, what God wants you to share tonight? Thank you very much. Good evening from me. Good Everybody. evening. It's, it's my pleasure, brothers and sisters, to share with you this evening what Jesus has done in my life. And it's great um, when I have the chance to share my testimony, to look back and get marvelous but, and amazed by what God has done in my life. So, um, as I said, when I introduced myself a little bit, when I came, um, I came my background of my family is non-Christian. Um, I came from a Muslim background. Um, my parents got divorced in the early state of marriage uh, when my mom was only three months pregnant. I have another sister, we're twins. Um, so, and after our dad left away, um, our mom was the only one who would take care and would look after us and would do like everything that we can be um, the best students and we can have like everything and nothing would, would, would miss. So um, this is how it went for 15 years and after that sadly she passed away on 2016 as, um, as, a, as a cause of uh, cancer, like um, a liver uh, cancer, which it was very terrible and it was very sad for, for both of us to experience that because we've seen her as an important person, as, as, a, as a shoulder for us when we can go and we can cry and, and ask for her. So on, on the same time, we got to know our father, which um, we had a lot of issues with him, and he wanted to have the authority as a father, which he lost many times um, and many years ago. Um, we, 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 we had like a lot of issue with him. We, we tried sometimes um, to, to rebuild this relationship, which it, it was broken, but it was impossible. We came from different um, world perspectives and it was very, very hard. So in, in this time, me and Casey, which it was the middle of the chaos, we were dealing with our father and our mom passed away and we were 15 years old and we just started high school and it was a chaos and it was a very depressive time. We were asking for peace and we were asking for a safe place for, for a family because the family sense this time was destroyed. We kind of have lost the concept of family. We didn't know what was that. <coughs> So in the middle of this, we had an invitation to a youth club in the church by our friend. And actually, me and Casey was, were asking, like, so sadly to go outside of the house and, and just do something that it was out of the problems. And there we started to know about Jesus and to know about uh, God and his miracles and everything that he, he does to, to people lives, like very transforming and life-changing. And during that time, I, I started to uh, surrender and I started to put my faith on him and said, okay, I, I cannot do anything to fix my problems life. So if you are greater and if you say that you do this kind of miracles, come in my life and solve all this kind of issues. And another um, a verse that has really encouraged me during that time and it released me a lot was from Matthew 
chapter 11, um, verses 28 until 30, which it says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Um, so God knows what was going on in our lives, even though we would not express that fully. Um, he know that we didn't have like a family and that sense was destroyed. So he provided abundantly. Uh, on this youth club that we were going, the leaders, um, which are Armal and Denisa, that Ian uh, introduced them on Sunday, they become our family. So we share the history with them and uh, they make uh, us part of their family and of their life. So, and for a long time, yeah, since that year, 2016 until now, we've been part of their family and they've, they've been like caring, um, mentoring us and watching after us like in every step that we were doing. So yeah, and God has provided abundantly and, and life in him has been like very, very great. Um, my Heavenly Father has been the father that I, I never had like in, in my life. So praise God for everything that he has done now in our lives. And we're trying, like both me and my sister, to walk every day on him and to be people with influence and godly woman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> a super testimony. Every testimony is super. Have you noticed that? Testimonies are different, but they all center around the person of Jesus Christ and what he has done to bring people from darkness through to light and the blessing that he's placed upon them and will continue to do so. Ladies, would you like to join me back up here? That's, that's great. We are going to sing again. Um, we've had one old hymn. We've had one more modern hymn. Well, we're going backwards. We're going to a hymn that uh, was written uh, during the course of the 18th century. Do you want to put the first uh, verse up? Uh, Elaine, that's great. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall power, every tongue confess him king of glory now. I guess most of us have got some idea of that, and we've sang it. Uh, most certainly in the past. The thing that always confuses, not it, 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 it confuses me sometimes when we're singing the hymn, or when I'm singing the hymn, is that between the verses, there's a little bit on the piano. There's a little bit, isn't there, really? And I always come in too early, yeah? <laughs> Barry's got a habit of doing that as well. I found that out from sitting next to him over the past couple of weeks, yeah? There was one occasion when we both came in too early and when we were talking about it at the home group the following week, Barry said, no, it wasn't us that were, uh, was early, uh, it was everybody else that was late. <laughs> and then he said, including Lisa, well, how on earth can you work that out? But there were, uh, you'll remember that now and you'll remember there's that little bit between verses. What else have I been told to tell you at this point in time? I remember we uh, now take up an offering morning and evening when we have an evening service here at church. We haven't done it uh, during COVID. We haven't done it for a long time. Uh, but during the course of this hymn, if you want to take a or you want to avail yourself of the offering plate as Bill brings it around, then this is the opportunity to do so. Okay, but we'll stand to sing. Uh, so away we go. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess him, King of glory. Father's pleasure, we should call 
can be seated, but can you stay up here for just two minutes? Is that okay? And Maxine at the piano. We're going to sing another hymn. Is that okay? Can you manage another hymn? I'm sure you can. Uh, even if you couldn't, you wouldn't confess to it, would you? No, of course not. Uh, it's, it's the oldest hymn that we're going to sing this evening. Okay, it was uh, written in the late 1700s. Not too many of us were around at that point in time, I'm sure. Uh, but it's a hymn that uses... Uh, older phraseology, older, use, uh, uses uh, older words. Um, it, it's written, I guess, in old English, you could say. But uh, if you can get past that, and it's not complicated, it really isn't. It's got some smashing theology in it. Uh, it really has, and it's got a jolly good tune as well, and I'll tell you about that in just a minute. Can we put the first verse up, Elaine? And uh, I'm sure that many of you will recognize it. Look, ye saints, the sight is glorious. See the man of sorrows now. From the fight return victorious. Every knee to him shall bow. Crown him, crown him. Crown him, crown him. Crowns become the victor's brow. And then the fourth verse, the last verse, which I think is my favorite verse. Hark those bursts of acclamation. Hark those loud, triumphant chords. Jesus takes the highest station. Jesus takes the highest station. Oh, what joy the sight affords. Crown him, crown him, crown him, crown him. King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, this hymn will go to several tunes. Several tunes. But in order that we shouldn't get confused, I decided this evening that we would sing it to Cumronda. What else would we sing it to? Okay, so it's come on there. And uh, if you're up to it, well, let's stand to sing, and then you can have a rest after that. Do you have our... Victorious, every knee to him shall bow. 
first line of the PowerPoint up uh, for me, please. Good. Those words are to be found in the Apostle Paul's letter to the Philippians, uh, verse uh, 10 of chapter 3. Paul was in prison when he recorded these words. He was in prison only because of the fact that he preached the gospel. He was determined to tell as many people as possible about the Lord Jesus Christ. And I just want to look briefly with you this evening at those words. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. If you were to ask Trevor, what's his favorite gospel? Trevor would say to you without hesitation, Philippians. If you were to ask me, what's Phil's favorite gospel? I would say to you without hesitation, and I only found this out a couple of weeks ago, it's Philippians. And I guess that uh, uh, for various people uh, who uh, would say that, that Philippians is their favorite of the Gospels, well, we'd all be of one mind that uh, the letter to Philippians is one that you can turn to at the spur of a moment. I've preached on the letter to the Philippians on so many occasions I've lost count. But I also know that if I sit down in my favourite armchair and I've got five minutes to spare and my Bible is alongside my chair, it's the letter to the Philippians that I will automatically turn to. Read it so many times, but yet when you read it, very often there is something fresh there that you've never seen before. And that happened to me when I looked at this particular set of words uh, a couple of weeks ago. Now, I cannot deal uh, with that as a text this evening uh, properly. Uh, it will take me a lot longer to do so. But what I'd like to do, really, is just share one or two thoughts as time will allow with you. In the verses immediately before these, the Apostle Paul has been reflecting upon his previous life. Life before he became a Christian. And many of you, most of you will know that the Apostle Paul, before becoming a Christian, had a Jewish pedigree that was impeccable. But then he reflects on the, on the fact that he is now a Christian. You'll remember, I'm sure, that dramatic event, that dramatic conversion experience on the road to Damascus. And now he describes the previous pedigree as worthless compared with the all-surpassing greatness of knowing the Lord Jesus as his saviour. He reflects upon the greatness of his salvation. He is overwhelmed by these things. He's lost in wonder, love and praise. And he says, I want to know more and more and more of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the meaning of the opening words of verse 10. The apostle wants to know more and more and more. The word translated for us into English is uh, one which is of a continuous uh, uh, tense. The apostle wants to know more and more and more. The apostle, remember, he was in prison. He's near the end of his life. He hasn't got long to go, but he still wants to know more more of the Lord Jesus. And I guess really before we go any further, there's a challenge there for you and 
I to know more and more of Jesus. <clears throat> now then, I've got two points for you this evening. I automatically put up three fingers. I've always <laughs> have three points, you might remember. <laughs> Not this evening. Okay, I'll put two fingers up. Got two points for you. Let's have the first one, Elaine. Growing in our relationship with Christ's person. Growing in our relationship with the person of Jesus Christ. You'll notice that Paul doesn't say knowing about him. But he says knowing him. Knowing Christ. And our pastor dealt with this very thought and subject a few weeks ago. The implications really are obvious as far as we are concerned. You could go home after this evening's service. And you could read one of the Gospels. If you had time, you could read all four of the Gospels. And you could say, I know all about Jesus. But the knowledge of what the Bible speaks here is a personal knowledge. It's not knowing about him so much as knowing him personally. It's not knowing him there in the head, but rather it's knowing him there down in the heart. That's what it means to be a Christian. To know Jesus Christ as Saviour, to know him as your Saviour in your heart. Being a Christian is not head knowledge of the Saviour. It's a relationship with the Saviour. Knowing him personally as Saviour and then, and then continuing to grow in our relationship with him. I don't know all of the people that are present this evening. But I guess, really, uh, that it's my responsibility to say to you, do you know the Lord Jesus in a personal way as your saviour? I'm not talking about knowledge, head knowledge. I'm talking about a faith, a faith that comes from a heart's knowledge of Jesus Christ as saviour. If you can't say that you do, then you need to speak to me or Gordon or somebody like that at the end of the service because this is the most important question that you can find confronting you. It is the most important decision uh, that you have to make during the course of this lifetime. And the sooner, quite frankly, you make it, the better for you and your eternity. I remember, I guess it would have been about 1982, I was pastor of a church in Cheshire, and uh, I very often used to go to Warrington uh, Church, uh, Warrington Hospital, Warrington General Hospital, and visit members of my congregation that might be there. And indeed, if there were other people there that wanted to talk to me, I was delighted to talk to them as well. Those were days when Gideon Bibles were found alongside every uh, hospital bed. And, and indeed, it wasn't unusual for a minister or a clergyman uh, just to wander around and take the opportunity of talking to people and praying with people if they wanted him so to do. And I uh, used to do that. And I got to know members of the staff as well as the people. I knew the members of the staff better because the, uh, uh, the, the people in the beds were, were rotating as it were. And uh, I remember talking to, to one ward sister and, and she said to me, uh, Mr. Williams, she said, very polite, uh, most of them call me who, uh, but she called me Mr. Williams. Mr. Williams, she said, uh, are you one of these evangelicals? I said, by God's grace, I am. And she said, well, tell me, she said, what's the difference about you? I cannot help but notice there's something different about evangelicals. I've been going to church, she said to me, all of my life. When I'm not working on a Sunday, I go to church. If I don't go to church because I'm working, I make certain that I send my offering and put that in by somebody else. What is it that's different? I know all about Jesus. I went throughout Sunday school, she said. I know all about Jesus. And I said, will you stop there for a minute? You've hit the nail, a nail right on the head. You know all about Jesus. I know him. I know him. And we went into a day room and I spent a while chatting to her and then left her with a little booklet called Journey Into Life and she promised that she would read it. And uh, to my delight and to God's glory, a few weeks later I went along to the hospital again and I was walking, I wasn't expecting to see her, she was walking down a corridor towards me and she was waving a hand for all she was worth. She said, I've read the book and I've prayed the prayer. Hallelujah. 
She knew all about Jesus. But now, by God's grace, she knew him. And I kept in touch with her. And it was obvious that she who'd come to know the Saviour was growing, 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 week by week, month by month, in her personal knowledge of him. Paul says, I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ. Second point, please, Elaine. Growing in our experience of the power of the resurrection. Our text, you'll remember, I want to know Christ, said Paul, and the power, the power of his resurrection. I want to think specifically about, just for a while, that word resurrection, where the resurrection fits into the scheme of things as far as we are concerned. I say to you again, I cannot do justice uh, to uh, that text in a short time. But just some thoughts, really, for you to dwell over during the week ahead when you're sitting in your favourite armchair and you've got five minutes in which you've got nothing to do. Think about these matters. Let's think about this. Doctrinally is where we need to start. When we talk or think about the death of the Lord Jesus Christ and we heard, we heard our pastor dealing brilliantly with that subject this morning. I trust that the resurrection of our Lord and Saviour is never very far from our discussions and our thoughts. That's vitally important. You know that. I see David nodding his head. Vitally important. The cross upon which Jesus died always needs to be accompanied, accompanied by a clear picture of an open and empty tomb. Most unbelievers that unbelieving world round and about us. Amongst unbelievers, very often, Christianity is portrayed as having no power whatsoever. Unbelievers at Christmas time are confronted by the image of a baby in a manger. Oh, they say, how sweet. And they see no power. At Easter time, and Easter is just around the corner, unbelievers are confronted by a dead person hanging on a cross. And again, there is no power. They lose sight of the fact that the babe of Bethlehem became the Christ of Calvary's cross and having died for the sins of the world, was risen from the dead and is King of kings and Lord of lords. They lose sight of the fact. They never understand that he is alive, that he is alive. I remember an occasion, it would have been about 1977. 1977, I hadn't been converted long, it was uh, just about a year. I was standing in Swansea Post Office in a queue that was unbelievably long. I think all queues in post offices are long. <laughs> yeah, there we are. And I was twiddling my thumbs and just looking around me. And the chap stood in front of me. Big guy, big guy. Jimmy turned around and looked at me. And I looked at him, rough looking guy. Big guy, rough looking guy. And he had a chain around his neck. And on the chain, there was a crucifix. There was a crucifix. And the figure of Jesus was attached to the cross. I thought, well, here is an opportunity now for evangelism. But oh, <laughs> this guy was big. And, and I thought, can I, can I cope with this? Can I tackle this chap? But the conviction from God that I should say something was uh, uh, overcoming, really. And, and I said to him, excuse me, I said, excuse me. Yes, he said. And uh, I said, I noticed the crucifixion uh, around your uh, neck. Yes, he said, my girlfriend, give it to me. Uh, I said, you, you'll have noticed that uh, uh, on the crucifix is a figure of Jesus. Uh, did you know that Jesus died for your sins as he died for mine? Uh, oh, he said. And, and I said, did you know that Jesus has been raised from the dead and he can change your life as he's changed mine? He told me to go away. <laughs> Those weren't the words, incidentally, that he used. <laughs> and, and, and I described, I decided that on that occasion, discretion was the better part of valour. But people uh, like that guy, 
having no idea about what he was wearing around his neck. That he was wearing something that showed the figure of Jesus who died for him and was raised from the dead and could change his life. If you read your way through the Acts of the Apostles, you will find, I'm sure I'm right in saying this, that whenever the early church leaders preached about Jesus Christ, they preached about him crucified, but they never forgot to mention as well that he was risen from the dead. The apostle, in another one of his epistles, the first one that he wrote to the Corinthian church, well, said this, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, our preaching is useless and so is our faith. If Christ has not been raised, our faith is futile. We are still in our sins. But, says Paul, Christ has been raised from the dead. And in the epistle that he wrote to the Romans, right at the very beginning of it, the apostle went on to say that Jesus Christ has been declared with power to be the Son of God, how? By his resurrection from the dead. So doctrinally, doctrinally, the power of the resurrection is of ultra importance. Ultra importance. We know that, Hugh, you might be saying to me, we know that. What about some examples? Well, hang on, and I'll find just one or two for you. Think about uh, the matter of the resurrection from a practical point of view. We pray to our Heavenly Father. How do we do it? We do it in Jesus' name. Why do we pray to our God and our Father in Heaven in Jesus' name? Because Jesus is alive. Because he's alive. That's a practical example of the power of his resurrection. If he was dead, it would be pointless praying in his name. There would be no power. The same applies to the promises of God towards us and which we love and which we lean upon. You remember uh, that promise that uh, Jesus has promised never to leave us or to forsake us. Never to leave us or forsake us. Now how is that possible? Because he is alive. Another example of the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I believe in the eternal security of the believer. And uh, several sets, I guess, of verses come to my mind. There's two to be found in John's Gospel. In John's Gospel and in verse 10, our Lord said to his disciples, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. How can that be? How can no one snatch you and I, who know Christ as Savior, out of our Lord's hand? Because, because he is alive. Because he is alive. And then, and with one eye on the clock, let me remind you of what we read in John's Gospel in chapter 14, where our Lord, again speaking to his disciples, says, I am going to prepare a place for you. I'm going before you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and I will take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. How can you do all of those things? Because he is alive. The Bible is full, full of good things like that which we're able to find and which are a blessing and an encouragement to us in every way. When we uh, lived in Spain, I remember one occasion, on this particular occasion, it wasn't a long stretch we spent in, in, in Spain, uh, but we were only there for three months. Eric and Tony came to see us during the course of that time, and they spent the best part of a week, if my memory serves me correctly, uh, uh, with us. We, we lived in an apartment that was owned by a lady from Switzerland. Delightful lady she really was. Can't remember her name now. But uh, 
we, we, we talked to her about the Lord Jesus quite openly, talked to her about what we believed. And, and she was quite interested. Quite interested, I think, is the way to describe her reaction. Politely interested would be a better way to describe her reaction. On one occasion, Elizabeth was getting a little bit fed up with this, and she said to this lady, uh, she said, uh, understand this, she said, uh, to Hugh and me, uh, the Lord Jesus is more real than you are, and we can reach out and touch you. <coughs> and, and, and she was amazed at that, this lady. She said, how can that be? And in unison, as if we'd rehearsed it, we both said at the same time, because Jesus is alive. And that got through to her. It shook her. She was of a one, uh, a very pale uh, complexion anyway. But she got even paler because she didn't know what to say. And, uh, and, and, and she walked away from us. And uh, uh, a little while later, we were able to give her a Bible. Now, we don't know if she's reading that Bible, if she stopped reading that Bible. We pray for her from time to time, although we cannot remember her name. And we just pray that she might come to that understanding that this is the reality of the Christian faith, knowing Jesus, knowing that he is alive. Try this deeper example now, which is also a call to holiness, and uh, I guess is relevant for each and every one of us this evening who know Jesus as Saviour. You theologians, hang on to your seat, and if I've got this wrong, come and tell me afterwards, okay? I don't think I have got it wrong, but I wouldn't stand here and say it to you. Consider the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ before his crucifixion and resurrection, and then after those events. Throughout his walk upon the earth, before his death, he, the Lord Jesus, was tempted in every way as are we, without sin, without sin, but nevertheless tempted as are we. You remember, he was tempted by the devil. He was tempted by the crowds as he was hanging on the cross. Yet, yet, after his crucifixion and his resurrection, there is no temptation. The battle is over. The victory has been won. The devil and the flesh and the world are defeated. Now here is the power of the resurrection. Now I'm not saying, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that Christians can enter in to the resurrection power of Jesus Christ to such an extent that temptation ceases. Oh, that I could say that. Oh, that I could say that. Neither am I advocating a doctrine, a doctrine of, uh, uh, I've, I've forgotten what it's called, it'll come in just a minute. I'm not uh, advocating uh, a, a, a doctrine of sinless perfection. That's the phrase I was trying to think of. Not sinless perfection or entire sanctification. But I am saying that as we grasp more and more of the reality of the power of the resurrection that is available to us by God's grace, the ability to know more and more of a triumph and a victory over temptation, the power of the resurrection of our Lord and Saviour. So for Christians, where do I finish this evening? So for Christians, we can say that in terms of our growth as Christians, in terms of our growth in holiness, our growth in sanctification, our general growth in spirituality, us becoming more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ in every aspect of our lives, the power of the resurrection has a vital part, a vital part to play. Thank you for listening to me. The resurrection in Welsh, a lovely word, it rolls off the tongue. My yesi wedi Hallelujah. Jesus is alive. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, how are we going to finish this evening? How are we going to finish? We're going to sing another hymn, and I guess really that it has to be a resurrection hymn. Now then, thine be the glory. Risen, conquering Son, endless is the victory, 
Thou, O death, hast won. Angels in bright raiment rolled the stone away, kept the folded grave clothes where thy body lay. Words of triumph, words of triumph. Let's stand and worship together. <clears throat>